What's up guys? I'm here with my buddy Hasib. Now Hasib is just a buddy. He just joined the Block Geeks team and he's our, what do you call yourself? The Evangelist. The Evangelist. Now, yeah. D-E-V, so you're taking Evangelist, combining it with Developer, and you're getting Devangelist. He's going to be creating all the courses on Block Geeks, teaching everybody the technicalities from Ethereum through maybe even IPFS, and just really becoming a good engineer. So Hasib, welcome to the family, and welcome to the Mir Rosic YouTube channel, brother. Awesome, glad to be here. Thanks yeah. for having me. So how's it been so far, man? Kind of diving into the blockchain space. Oh, it's like um, entering the matrix. There's just so much information, so much to learn. Yeah. Um, but it's been great. It's been great just learning about the cool things that people are doing around the world um, with this new innovation platform. Yeah. So what are we talking about today? Uh, so today I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the limitations of blockchain. Um, and how we're trying to overcome them. Yeah. Um, so we're trying to achieve scale and we want you know, enterprises to use blockchain. But uh, right now, one of the major problems is the throughput of you know, even the best blockchains like Ethereum, Bitcoin, the throughput is nowhere near comparable to you know, centralized companies like Visa or like MasterCard. So, you know, one of the questions is how do we get to that scale? How do we get to that throughput? Mm. Um, and one of the solutions for that problem is um, proof of stake versus proof of work. So right now we have this proof of work consensus algorithm on the blockchain, which says, hey, everybody who is mining on the network mm -hmm. needs to agree on what the consensus is, needs to agree on mining using rigs. Right, yeah. right. So how do you agree on the current state of the world? Um, and uh, so the way proof of work, the way proof of work works is that everyone has to validate it versus in proof of stake, there is a set number of validators, which is smaller than everyone in the network. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could argue that it's taking away some of the decentralization aspect of blockchain. And some security aspects too. Right, but it's doing it for the trade-off of, okay, how do we get the throughput um, higher? Is there also, so since we're on proof of stake versus proof of work, proof of stake, people are actually staking Ether on Casper. Right, so instead of in proof of work where you're actually staking, you know, you're staking well, resources, money. right? Oh, yeah, I spend yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on ASICs and on right. city on and the mining and renting right. and everything. Exactly, yeah. so you're putting down money. So what they're trying to do is just virtualize all that because yeah. all of that, all of the heat and the mining uh, and the electricity yeah. that is generated is not, not so great for our environment. So proof of stake basically tries to virtualize all that and says, hey, instead of you know spending real money to buy physical hardware, you can spend ether and put it down as like a deposit mm. uh, to be a miner in the network. And also you have slashing conditions, right? So if you put down ether, and correct me if I'm wrong, you put down ether, you stake it, and if you're a bad actor, because how I understand it with proof of stake, at least for Casper, maybe this is also for EOS and everyone else who has their own proof of stake model, consensus is by default, everyone's a bad actor until you prove yourself otherwise. Right, right. So the entire concept behind decentralization is to assume that everyone cannot be trusted. Mm. So how do you conduct business with somebody who can't be trusted? How do you have that intermediary, that software, that middleware to facilitate so that how does proof of, like So right now it's roughly, let's say, 14 transactions a second on Ethereum. And if you have an ERC-20 token, it's like seven transactions. So all these ICOs out there promising all this, but the reality is that actually, we're <laughs> years away from what they think they can do. Right. Uh, not from just a technical aspect, also from a scaling aspect, from a psychological aspect, like use case scenario aspect, from a security aspect, right. and a financial right. aspect. So that being said, I'm curious, how does proof of stake increase scalability? Uh, well, it reduces the amount of work required to generate a new block. Okay. Right. So the blockchain, the heartbeat of the blockchain is, you know, every time between blocks. Yeah, exactly. So every it's like a pulse, right? Like every few seconds or a few minutes, you generate a block. Yeah. And that block um, basically requires a bunch of people on the network to agree that this is the true block. This is what the next block hash will be. Yeah. Um, and what it's essentially doing is lowering the amount of people required for that validation. Okay. So that, that can speed up the validation okay. process. Okay. So we can generate blocks faster and validate transactions faster as a result. Okay. All right. 
Have they said when they're coming out with Casper? Um, I don't think they've set a full date. I think it's sometime in 2018. Uh, I, I'm interested to see that happen. I'm interested to see how uh, sharding plays out. Right, right. Breaking right. apart. And so one big experiment. I don't know what to expect. I'm not expecting anything. I don't want to set any expectations. I'm, I'm going to sit back and relax and see how all these uh, platforms execute on their promises. Okay, so, you know, that's Ethereum. Ethereum states that they can scale, and I'm not too sure the numbers. I think it goes to thousands of transactions a second once. Hypothetically, With plasma and all these plasma, sharding, et cetera, et cetera. That's one thing. Um, you mentioned other things before. So for this. Yeah, so enterprise is also, um, you know, like a company like Netflix, they also want to use storage on the blockchain, yeah. right? But right now, um, computation and storage on the blockchain is very expensive, and storage is far more expensive than computation. So Ethereum wasn't built to be. Well, that's another thing. It, it, I'm glad you brought that up. Storing large amount of data on a blockchain doesn't fly. It's the worst ever. Like for God's sake, even with Bitcoin, they're debating one megabyte to two megabytes. Right. You know what I mean? Like think about megabytes, not right? Right, right, uh, right. So the whole idea when people say we're gonna store something on the Ethereum blockchain on the big no. Right. You're not right. storing anything in the blocks. Right. So right now it's infeasible to do that. Infeasible. It's, it's, it's too expensive to yeah. do that, right? So what people do is they come up with workarounds, right? Yeah. Like instead of storing the MP3, they'll store a hash, a hash of the MP3, yeah. right? So that it's a fixed size and they know how much space it's yes. going to take. Um, but if you're trying to build something like Netflix, where you know you're you're distributing video to millions of users around the world, yeah, you can't build that entirely on the blockchain right now. Um, so some of the solutions that we've come up with to to actually store data. Um, in a decentralized way, right? Because we want this to be decentralized. Like if we have a storage system like S3 or Dropbox and we all start using that, right? That still kind of defeats the purpose because it's centralized, it can be attacked and you know, it can cause damage to other networks that are dependent sure. on it, right? So some solutions to this are IPFS and storage, yeah. uh, which provide decentralized storage solutions. So instead of your data being stored, you know, on a server farm, your data is distributed across the world. Um, and that sort of redundancy guarantees that, okay, like you won't lose your data. Um, and you can still be pretty confident that it'll be there and anyone else who wants to access it can access it. Mm -hmm. um, so these storage solutions are far cheaper than storing data on the actual blockchain itself. Mm -hmm. um, so what people are doing is, you know, using the hash um, to maybe reference uh, a file on IPFS. Yeah. So that's a common work. Yeah, IPFS works around, correct me if I'm wrong, they're just hashing data from, they're just connecting data into one big hash. Right, right. So what they're doing is, you know, instead of having, you know, really long URLs to reference, like an image, for instance, yeah. they're just having, um, you know, small hashes that uniquely identify a file on the web. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, that's that's one of the problems uh, with blockchain. Another problem today is you know bringing in data from the real world online um, into the blockchain. Like yeah. how do you do that? You can't. The blockchain won't automatically know things that are happening. It's a massive the problem. Right? Onboarding right. problem, huge. Right. Huge. So, so you need to figure out how to inject that data into the blockchain. How do you tell it that hey, um, you know like Hasib shipped. Amir like a pencil, mm. how does the blockchain know that Amir actually got that pencil, mm -hmm. right? Right now, the blockchain, it, it can't figure it out by itself, right? So we need to tell it, um, and you know, some ways that we have of telling it that is, you know, maybe in our transaction, we have a third verifier who approves that, okay, like Amir indeed got um, the pencil, and you know, we don't even need to get to a third person. That can only be in the case of, uh, you know, a dispute where, you know, someone says that, uh, you know, the transaction didn't go through, we can yeah. have a third party verifier, but, uh, you know, if we, if we have some sort of trust between each other, we can say that, okay, like I've received the pencil, this transaction is complete and I can receive, uh, my money. Mm -hmm. Um, so where do you think, like, let's pause for it. Where do you think, like, do you think we're like two to four years away from like fixing these scalability issues? Like truly understanding that we've scaled it to this many users and this much financial, uh, uh, input into this ecosystem? Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to say, like, was it going to be two years or four years? But I think, I think over the next, let's say five years, 
I think I think we'll start seeing the scale that we need to be, um, you know, enterprise level scale. So then, all these crazy startups happen these days, raising millions and millions of dollars. Right, right. Like to me, you know, unscalability promises. Well, well, you know, God bless them for trying. Right. You know what I mean? But like, there's what you want, and then there's reality. Right. You no, know, I right. want to be an NBA basketball player. I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm six on the dot. I can't jump for shit. You know what I mean? So that's reality. Right. And right. it'll probably take me five years to increase my fucking hoops right, by right, an inch right. or two, right? Right, right. And it's right. not now. It's not now. Right. I, mean, I can't right. see myself as an NBA superstar. Right. Uh, so you know, all these startups, you know, raising twenty, thirty, forty, fifty million dollars on right. these ICOs, right. promising these techno technological euphoria solutions for everything. Uh, but in reality, is the technology can do that. Is this a white paper? <laughs> no beta, no alpha, no nothing. Right, right. Most most of these are just ideas, right? And that's that's one of the downsides of like an innovation platform yeah. like Ethereum, right? It enables funding of of you know weird and wacky ideas that may not get traditional funding, but you can also um, man, I'm down for weird and wacky ideas. But as Ethereum is a foundation, I think we need more foundations as opposed to ICOs. Right. If the right. whole point is R&D research, which exists, think tanks, but the bureaucracy behind functioning and running a think tank, it's ludicrous, right? There's right. a lot of red tape and paperwork. But hey, if the whole purpose uh, is to expedite and accelerate the advancements of the technology, then why don't we create more foundations? Right. right? right. I'm not expecting a return from the foundation, Hell, I'll throw money into R and D if that's gonna better, but you can't profit off it. Right. This right. is this is for everybody. This open is infrastructure. source infrastructure, no patent, no nothing. Anybody on the fucking planet right. can use this technology. Right, right. And I also don't believe in uh, you know companies like building like core infrastructure and saying that they're gonna solve scalability problems and then asking for money an ICO to do that. Like that that doesn't just doesn't sit well with yeah. me and I think the larger community as well. Cool. Any last thoughts? Um, you know, all that being said, even though we do have issues, like that's what makes this exciting. You know, if, if it just everything just worked, yeah, uh, we wouldn't have uh, things to work on. So, that's right. uh, you know, it's a very exciting field, regardless of uh, you know some of the challenges that we're facing. But uh, you know, we have some of the best minds working on it. That's so. right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, guys, if you want to find more about Hasib, check out Block Geeks. Also, if you're looking for any training when it comes to Ethereum coding, maybe even IPFS like really upping your level as an engineer, as a coder, even as a non-technical person, uh, visit blockings.com where we offer online training. All right, guys, if you want to leave a comment, please do below and we'll make sure to answer them. Have a great day. Peace. Thank you.